Uh, just by way of background, um, I wrote a book on China's ocean frontier about uh, 15 years ago and I thought in approaching this subject that I could write a book on China's cyber frontier. Uh, so sort of studying it quite a little bit and of course you'll all think how foolish that was because there aren't frontiers in cyberspace, but that's where I started from. <coughs> The book I wrote uh, on China's ocean frontier was really looking at the military developments, the economic developments, uh, you know, and where the issues sat in Chinese politics. I thought I could do the same in uh, respect of China's cyber policy, but I found out pretty quickly I couldn't, because that's not how the Chinese leaders viewed the problem. They understood. Uh, cyber domain as representing a transformationalist set of problems for their country and they had framed this in respect of something called the information society ambition. Of course they were not alone in doing this, in fact they were probably about 20 or 30 or 40 years or even 50 years behind the play in respect of framing that ambition. Uh, so the problem we're talking about today uh, can be judged from two main perspectives. One is that cyber policy is just something like education policy or uh, something like uh, road building or the information superhighway. Or that's one point of view. Or we can understand cyber policy as representing a fundamental transformation of almost everything that we do, especially strategic relationships and military power. And how you react to what I say today and what you read in the newspapers or in other specialist sources about China's cyber policy really depends on whether you take point of view A or point of view B. Uh, I'm, I've taken point of view B uh, and the Chinese leaders certainly take point of view B and that was reasserted uh, only yesterday in a letter from President Xi Jinping to the International Conference on the Internet in Wenzhou in China where he said that the core, that the internet and information technology is at the core of a fundamental transformation of economic and social uh, realities. So I've got a, a presentation today uh, which goes through the book uh, and the, uh, some of the main ideas in the book. But I wanted to highlight first the proposition that we don't know much in the public domain about China's cyber military power or its cyber espionage capability. So we've got lots of news stories, but we don't know much. Uh, you know, for example, we don't know how many people uh, actually work uh, on certain aspects of Chinese uh, cyber espionage. We don't know how advanced Chinese cyber weapons are. This is the public domain I'm talking about. So it's very hard for us to frame a point of view. So how do we understand, how can we legitimately talk about China's cyber military capabilities and cy China's cyber espionage capabilities in the public domain? Well, the way we can do it is we can understand the medium in which those policies are developed. So through the Cold War, it was a common uh, for us Sovietologists, of which I was one, to come to understand how the Soviet system worked in the military sphere by understanding how the Soviet system worked in other spheres of policy. Uh, and uh, we did come to find, and it was proven after the end of the Cold War, once uh, a lot more information came out, that it's almost impossible for a country to make leaps and bounds in its military sector if it's not matching its ambition uh, in the civil sector. So you can't just instantly dream up massive, uh, massively advanced cyber military capability if you don't have massively advanced information technologies uh, in many domains in your society. So the proposition that the book is based on in large part is that to understand China's cyber military and espionage capabilities and policies, ambitions and limitations, we have to understand what are the, what is the medium in which those people in those sectors operate uh, and what is the, uh, the strength of Chinese capability uh, in the civil sector. So that was really a departure point. So coming into the writing the book and coming into this presentation, uh, I was overwhelmed really with a lot of China success stories and how wonderful China was and how it had done all these wonderful things and uh, there are some achievements listed uh, here on this uh, first slide uh, with all of which you'd be familiar with. Uh, China is now the biggest manufacturer of PCs in the world. Uh, it's got more netizens than any other country uh, in the scientific sphere. Uh, 
it has, uh, at least at a theoretical level, devised the first teleportation of remote particles. Now, don't ask me to explain that, but uh, according to United States scientists, uh, in Chinese capability in advanced IT research is not insignificant. And that's one of the uh, sort of uh, signature achievements of their scientific research. Uh, in the engineering sector, the Chinese are taking a leadership role in uh, Internet Protocol version 6 uh, and as, a, as an important uh, uh, additional element to talk about their achievements, they've actually constructed the biggest surveillance system in human history that's based in large part on information technology, but not exclusively. So we can't, so they're, they're actually doing some really big and wonderful things. Interestingly, the World Economic Forum, which has been publishing an annual review of international cyber capabilities since 2002-2003, uh, has ranked China rather badly uh, in recent years. So the first report uh, put out by Harvard University, in fact, in collaboration with the World Economic Forum, uh, ranked China 64th. Uh, the system of ranking uh, took some time to settle down and it varied over the years. It's become more consistent in recent years, but since 2011, China has slipped from 36th in the world to 61st, according to the World Economic Forum. Now, how does that square with all of these wonderful achievements that we've just seen mentioned on the previous slide and we often read about in the press? Well, the interesting news is that the Chinese leaders accept that they're slipping in global rankings in terms of advanced information technology and the application of advanced information technology to their problems, whether they're political, civil or military uh, or developmental. And the, uh, even though there's a, a wealth of detail uh, concealed in these rather simplistic uh, index rankings uh, and one could critique them in all sorts of ways, uh, it is important to take note that China is slipping relatively uh, compared with other countries and that Chinese leaders accept that this is, is an important area of concern for them. So let's just think ahead to the, to the end of this presentation and ask, well, if China is slipping in the civil sector from 36 to 51st in the world, 36 to 61st, then where is it going in military capability? What's the relationship between that slippage in the civil sector uh, and uh, uh, their gains or uh, relative position in the military sector. So just to position uh, China's evolution uh, in this sphere of uh, information society or information economy, we can go back uh, to 1983 when the Chinese leaders took the first big decisions to become an advanced information technology country. They didn't have the idea of an advanced information society at that time, even though um, as uh, early as 1980 in Japan, the idea of computopia had been surfaced by uh, a leading Japanese uh, uh, thinker. In 1983, uh, the book by Alvin Toffler called Third Wave was very popular in China, a fact which uh, Nigel was talking about just the other day since he was in Beijing um, at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, was reputed to have read that book along with the uh, then uh, Prime Minister, Zhao Ziyang. Interestingly, Jiang Zemin was appointed as Assistant, sorry, Deputy Minister of Electronics in 1983. So Jiang Zemin, uh, as Nigel was mentioning to me yesterday, was rather inconspicuous sort of chap and not that important uh, around about that time. Deputy Minister was nothing special, it was quite some achievement. But uh, in 1984 he was appointed Minister and sent overseas to begin the first uh, big trawling effort by the Chinese to bring in uh, Western investment, Western technology in the electronic sector. The most significant decision that the Chinese leaders took in 1983 was to set for themselves the target, not of quadrupling growth in the electronics industry by the year 2000, which was the target they had set for GDP as a whole, they set themselves the target of increasing the production in the electronic sector by a factor of eight. So they said, we're going to go for this massively ambitious, almost unimaginable growth target of quadrupling GDP by the year 2000. But, but at the same time, we're going to go for broke and increase the production in our civil sector in the electronics industry by a factor of eight. So what we saw unfold um, in the subsequent years 
was a deepening of that commitment uh, and a broadening of that commitment. Uh, one of the most amazing things that I found in researching this book was that the United States has been the main contributor to China's cyber power. China would not be the cyber power it is today without massive uh, contribution from the United States in investment and in technology transfer. That's good. We all agreed at the time that that was what should be done. It was a deliberate act of policy by the United States government, by Western Europe, by countries like Australia and Britain to invest in China and achieve that technology transfer and help it develop its economy. Of course, in 1985, the strategic relationship between China and the United States and the West was quite different uh, from subsequent years. But we have to understand that China as a cyber power is a cyber power only because the leadership committed itself to accepting investment, foreign investment in these industries, uh, and its partners committed to doing it. By the year 2000, the Chinese went into a, a slightly different direction. As the world was developing its policies towards an advanced information society, uh, looking forward to convening in 2002 and 2003 the World Summit on the Information Society, the Chinese leadership took decisions in the year 2000 that China would become an advanced information society. They were helped in no small part by the fact that through the 1990s that observed military developments in the United States uh, and in 1999, although some scholars contest the point of information I have here, but the United States used cyber operations against the electric grid in Belgrade. By 2003, uh, China had uh, certainly moved to a much deeper embrace uh, of these sets of issues, and on the military front by 2014, uh, Xi Jinping took control uh, and dis declared that China would become a cyber power. To try and wrap my arms around all of that sort of history for the purposes of the book, I wanted to focus on what the leadership, what the leaders think about this question of becoming an advanced information society. I knew I couldn't grapple with the, uh, all of the detail, uh, but I did really want to understand where they were going with the military sphere, uh, and to do that I felt I had to understand their entire ambition about information society. So I devised a framework of analysis for the book which identifies nine ideal values for any country wishing to become an advanced information society. Uh, they're listed there uh, in three groups. One is what do you have to do to the national information, what values do you have to hold about the national information ecosystem, what values do you have to hold about the information economy, uh, and what values do you have to ha hold about the international sphere in which you want to establish your security. So this is the level at which the Chinese leaders think. They know they want to protect their international information ecosystem. They know they want to develop it uh, and at the same time protect it. They know they want an innovative information economy and they know they have to achieve security in the world. So what are the values they have to have? So in the political sphere, they have to promote, any country who wants to be an advanced information society has to promote freedom of information exchange, protection of information exchange, and trusted information. And I think everybody in the room would instantly appreciate that in China, those three values are highly problematic. So if we want to achieve an advanced information society, and those three values are fundamental at the political level, and they don't exist in China, well, that's a bit of a problem. Can China become an advanced information technology country in a scientific sense if it doesn't have trusted information? If many things are state secrets, which in other countries are scientific data. So uh, we can go into that more later. I won't dwell on that set of leadership values in this presentation, but just bear in the background that that China is everything but an advanced information society at the political level. It talks about e-democracy, but it's an information dictatorship. And I'd like you to ask yourselves the question, can a country that's an information dictatorship become an advanced information society either in the civil sector or the military sector? So in the rest of the presentation, I'll dwell on this question of 
the uh, innovation in the economy, the civil economy, and then look at what that means for the military sphere reaching into the, the global <coughs> security system. To understand what I'm about to say, or to, in a sense, treat it sympathetically, uh, I'd like to put some of my assumptions on the table uh, so that uh, you can see where I'm coming from. <coughs> in writing the book and in researching the material, I found all the time I was coming up against really quite uh, persistent ideas of techno-nationalism. The idea that United States power depended on how many computers you built or how good they were, or that Chinese power de uh, depended upon how many computers they built or how many networks they had or how many uh, netizens they had. Uh, but really this old idea of techno-nationalism that, that somehow a country's policy is, is actually framed in these terms of of uh, techno-nationalism uh, or, or that the outcomes are determined by techno-nationalism is something that we have to sort of really grapple with as we try and analyse these issues. I came across a phrase um, in this research, knowledge has no flag, and I think that the very sort of good uh, way of understanding where China sits in the world, how it had to go out to get uh, all of this advanced information technology from the West, uh, and how in continuing to exploit it, uh, the way in which it exploits it defies conventional ideas of techno-nationalism. There are other uh, economic influences and uh, international influences on the way China is developing as a, uh, a, an advanced technology power, uh, including, for example, the idea that uh, Chinese growth will peak and that Chinese firms themselves will start to offshore their manufacturing to lower cost uh, uh, countries. Uh, and then the final point I guess I would ask you to consider in understanding the rest or in, in uh, evaluating the rest of what I'm going to say uh, is, to, uh, is to pose the question of how dependent is China on the rest of the world for the day-to-day -day operation of its information technology sphere. So I identified three ideal values for China to become, for any country to become an advanced information society, uh, transformation intent, they have to develop an innovation system, and they have to have an innovator class. And I'll just go quickly through the current situation, uh, my assessment in the book um, of these three sets of values. And what do we see from the evidence? Uh, we see really, at, at a basic level, only weak Chinese commitment to these three values. So that's surprising to a point. So let me reiterate, at the political sphere, we talked about trusted information, freedom of information exchange, uh, the Chinese leaders have shown only weak commitment to that set of values. When we come to the sort of less political sphere, the economic sphere, the Chinese leaders have shown themselves relatively incapable as well of developing advanced information technologies in civil sectors of the economy. So agriculture, for example, which is one of the most important politically sensitive sectors in the Chinese economy and in the Chinese society, um, has really only seen slow application of advanced information technology uh, to its, uh, what you might call, economic enterprise. Of some note, in comparison, what has been informatized in the rural economy in China uh, is the internal security system of the government, uh, and they informatized the education of Communist Party cadres in the countryside before they informatized the economic production aspects of, rural, um, uh, of the rural economy. So they have a high rhetorical commitment, and this is reflected in the Network Readiness Index of the World Economic Forum, which I mentioned. So China may be ranked 61st in the last World Economic Forum annual report, but it's actually ranked highest of any major power for the commitment of the government at a rhetorical level to becoming an advanced information society and applying advanced information technologies. So we have, in a sense, a high level of commitment by the Chinese leaders to becoming an advanced cyber power, but in almost all spheres of activity in the civil sector, in the economy, they're just not able to deliver it for in the way that they want. And there are reasons for that when you study the Chinese innovation system uh, and the timeline over which that's occurred. Uh, at every stage of uh, Chinese policy making in this particular domain, 
the Chinese government has sought the assistance of the World Bank and in the latest World Bank report, China 2030, uh, the World Bank authors, working with Chinese authors, were prompted to remind the Chinese leaders that innovation at the technological frontier is quite different in nature from simply catching up. So that there are all sorts of detailed assessments in that 2030 report which are worth looking at. But at the end of the day, after working with the World Bank for um, uh, sorry, working with China for about uh, 10 or 12 years on how it might become an advanced information economy, the World Bank is saying radically, quite radically in this latest report, more gently in its earlier reports, that China is just not doing what it has to do to become an advanced information society. One of the reasons for that is that China has not been able to build an innovator class relative to its ambitions. Uh, and there are, uh, again, all sorts of reasons for this. Uh, but one was that uh, education in information technology uh, was very weakly developed in China until 2001 when they undertook a massive expansion uh, in that field and of course we're seeing the payoff from that expansion. But there's all sorts of other problems uh, in the Chinese civil economy in respect of China becoming an advanced information economy. So it's got this vast range of, of interests but the absolute overwhelming one is internal security. I mentioned the state informatization leading group uh, earlier was the main leadership body which runs cyber policy in China. Well, you've got a, a, a whole body of people doing the economic side. Then you've got this group of rather, uh, well, the security apparatus, the internal security apparatus are also in charge. Well, I'm afraid that the military part of that has been rather weakly developed. So in in China, the, the bulk of cyber espionage capability is oriented towards internal security. And since China's internal security has been a deteriorating problem for the leadership uh, in the last decade, to a point where, around 2010, expenditures on internal security now exceed those on defence, then one might also translate that to China's cyber capability. If they're so concerned about internal security that they now spend more money on that than on defence, then they're probably spending more money on cyber espionage that's inwardly oriented or oriented towards their internal security problems abroad than they are on the military uh, part of it. Now that has to be tempered against certain knowledge that uh, Chinese government is scooping up all sorts of information, every bit of information it can get on the advanced technology uh, and military capabilities of foreign governments. I won't go into it now. I've done a detailed analysis of the public source evidence introduced by the United States government into the public domain of the purpose of that. Uh, and I'm convinced that the United States government argument that the Chinese government is siphoning up all of this information and putting it into its civil sector for civil production has not been proven. Uh, I can go into that a little bit later. But that general proposition that I've just made about you know, their main priorities in cyber espionage are elsewhere than aiding the civil economy, that speaks to these other propositions I put on the table about what China really wants out of its advanced information uh, advanced information technologies and what policies it really wants at the international domain. So uh, it's quite clear on the one hand that there are conflicts and contradictions between what they say they want and what they do and Nigel's work um, as he's been elaborating it and will elaborate it further on China's policies on internet governance speak to this uh, and you know I mentioned the set of values uh, the political value is important to an information society at the start around freedom of information exchange. Well, the Chinese government hasn't committed to that. Um, it says it wants it, but it doesn't. In the same way that it says it wants strategic stability in cyberspace, uh, it does things which contradict that. But what, we're, what we will see, I'm confident we will see it, in the next five years, uh, and we may already be seeing it uh, as I speak, there will be a shift by China to more collaborative behaviour in cyberspace and it will try and find a sort of a golden mean between uh, some of these destabilising behaviours in cyberspace uh, and some uh, and uh, its goal of what you might call uh, global stability and interdependent security. 
So to sum up, in broad terms we could say that a timetable of 2050 for full informatization of the armed forces is possible. That's perhaps a bit pie in the sky, uh, you know, who cares in a sense. Uh, the nature of uh, military power in 2050 may be very different from what it is today. Uh, but the value of these sorts of timelines um, to political people uh, is well captured in a phrase we use in Australia, which I'm sure came from this country, NIMTO, uh, not in my term of office, N-I-M-T-O-O. -O. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is two or th three or four leadership transitions away, so it doesn't matter to the current leadership if it doesn't happen. They use this as a sort of a, a long-term horizon. In trying to understand the impact of China's cyber espionage and the advance of its cyber military capabilities, we can only do so if we know what the other side has been doing, what the other countries have been doing. So in the same way that the World Economic Forum does an annual index of uh, capability in the civil sector and shows that China has been slipping uh, between 2011 and 2014 from 36th to 62nd, what is the comparable assessment on the military side? We don't have to, uh, what's the word, extrapolate directly and say, oh, well, it's probably slipped from 36th to 62nd in the military sphere as well. But imagine that it only stayed the same. Is it still 36th in the military sector in terms of um, cyber military capability? We know it's a lot better than that in cyber espionage. But that's a reflection of how easy it is to conduct cyber espionage and how vulnerable systems are to uh, that sort of hacking. It's not a reflection that China is especially good at it um, or that it does anything different with the information from what other countries do with it. Uh, we have to prove those other propositions. What's driving the Chinese leadership first and foremost is that they feel they have been unable to make a dent in the information superiority of the US Global Alliance system. If you compare the United States and China in cyber military capability, you've got the United States up here and you've got China down here. But it's not just the United States. It's 28 members of NATO, it's Japan, it's Australia, it's other countries who participate actively in cyber activities against China. So if you were China, would you be saying, I'm going to catch up and I'm going to overtake the United States as a cyber power sometime soon? Or would you be saying, I've got to do everything possible to restrain the United States cyber power so that it doesn't do something nasty to me? And then the final point to make, I think, is that we do have to acknowledge that China's race for capability has be, been destabilising its international relationships. Its use of cyber espionage has been destabilising its international relationships, particularly its efforts to uh, affect the critical infrastructure of the United States and some other countries. Uh, and so a focal point of future policy will be just how they reconcile those destabilising uh, acts with these broader ambitions to become an advanced cyber power. Let me stop there, Nigel.